After this video, you will likely tell me, stick to aircraft. In this video, I'm going to do something that I rarely do, stray from aircraft into general military. I've been asked to discuss the situation of the Ukrainian offensive and give my opinion. I am flattered by the fact that someone actually values my opinion, so I think I might give a small contribution to the debate. In particular, this is another subject that is highly divisive. Opinions range from the Ukrainians will get to Moscow soon to the Russians will soon be at the Polish border. As usual, reality is more nuanced than that. And an interesting nuance is that this is not a sport match. This is not a judiciary trial where law, truth and ethics have all their role. This is a war where there is no ethics, no law, and the only prize for winning is survival. There are plenty of channels that cater to this kind of polarized public. This is a different place. So, let's get started. There are plenty of YouTube channels that follow the operation day by day, doing an excellent job. For a detailed description, I recommend following Weeb Union and Defense Politic Asia, while for an in-depth analysis of single events, I suggest History Legends. Links in the description below. Here, I will just give some flashes functional to my interpretation. So, Ukraine prepared 18 to 35 brigades for the summer offensive. Only few of them are equipped with Western systems. Uh, the size of these units is relatively small with about 100 to 150 combat vehicles each in about 20 to 30 artillery tubes. However, likely the forces beyond the first 16-18 brigades are just light infantry. And while the Ukrainians were preparing the brigades, the Russians prepared a defensive line that covers the whole length of the front with the different densities. In the south, in the western sector, these defenses are three or four lines deep, and they stand in depth behind the front line. In other areas, for example in the north, there is just a single line. In front of the main lines in the south, there is a large buffer area between 10 and 20 kilometers deep, with a low density of defenses and units, whose job is basically to slow down an attacking force. The Ukrainians started the operations on the 6th of June with a heavy artillery and an in-depth attack by MLRS and Storm Shadows. In the south, which is commonly believed to be the main theater, at least so far, we can distinguish two stages. In the first stage, the Ukrainians tried to conduct movement operations with company-sized mechanized units, but this failed with fairly heavy losses on the Ukrainian side. In the second stage, the Ukrainians resorted to small infantry operations conducted by platoon-sized units that are basically still currently ongoing. There have been other attempts to conduct mobile operations more recently, but they really didn't work out. So the pressure is still on, and in the last few weeks, it actually seemed that Ukrainians sometimes take some days off to pause and regroup. The other major effort seems to be happening at the two sides of Bakhmut. In what I would call the second battle of Bakhmut, uh, the Ukrainians have regained some positions in the areas north and south of the town. However, probing or the coy operations happened and keep happening along the entire contact line. Ukrainian air force is having a limited role in the operations where perhaps the most important action is the delivery of the storm shadow missiles. Uh, we have seen some activity of the Ukrainian helicopters but definitely nothing major. The Russian Air Force, on the contrary, it is very active at least if compared to the month in the beginning of 2023. Helicopters in particular have been very effective in the first couple of weeks of operations to counter the Ukrainian mechanized forces. Their activity though was reduced when the main operating base was hit, destroying some machines and neutralizing several pilots. Overall, the Ukrainians have achieved some limited territorial gains in the south and around Bakhmut, but the Russians have gained territory in an offensive operation in the Crimea area. And in the last couple of days, there has been Russian pressure in the north in the Svatova area. In the moment I'm recording this, no breakthrough has happened. At the end of the day, the key is always air power, either achieved or denied, but in Ukraine, it is not what everybody expected before the war. There is a very high level of intelligence available to both sides, 
truer power, albeit of a strange kind. Ukraine has benefited by a massive influx of intelligence from NATO. Flying near Ukrainian border, there are always two AOX aircraft and one or two electronic intelligence platforms like the EC-135. Above the Black Sea, there are constantly other intelligence assets flying above international waters, either high altitude, long endurance, unmanned vehicles like the Global Hawk or other smaller platforms like the MQ-9. The RAF has ventured in the same area with their own RC-135. The P-8A are maritime surveillance and anti-submarine aircraft, but their capability of conducting alien operation is such that they can be used for intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. We also know that Mirage 2000D under National Authority flew intelligence missions above the Black Sea using the Astak Elint pod. So, the Russian order of battle is well known and this knowledge is passed on to Ukraine through a permanent structure operating in Germany. However, it seems that the information is not integrated with the operation of the Ukrainian armed forces. What I mean that there is no real-time communication between NATO and actively operating assets of the Ukrainian armed forces. For example, a pilot in flight is not receiving cues or data from the AWACS planes. This is an obvious measure to avoid escalation, but other more risky activities are known to have taken place. For example, we know that the RQ-170 stealth drones have violated the Crimean airspace at least nine times. We can just hope that no incident like the one that happened in Iran in 2011 is going to happen this time. However, these flying assets are not the only source of intelligence. The US has several hundreds of space-based satellites, many are communication assets, but many do provide all sorts of intelligence. They can do exactly what endo-atmospheric systems do. They do electronic intelligence, signal intelligence, radar reconnaissance, and so on. Moreover, they do imagery with a resolution of 10 to 20 centimeters, invisible light, or infrared, or who knows what else. This is more than enough to map trenches and count every single Russian asset in the area of operations. Even more important is the capability to use artificial intelligence to analyze the information acquired. This is something that the military intelligence has been studying well before then commercial applications started popping up 10 or 15 years ago. In the time of film or before artificial intelligence, a human had to carefully watch every image and extract the information. Now, algorithms can do that. They can simply identify what is changed or classify the vehicles in a parking lot. The decision maker receives only the relevant information without the noise of hundreds of perfectly normal forests, lakes, deserts, prairies, and town images. Don't get the impression that nothing could be hidden because it's not true. The strip covered by the satellite is relatively narrow and orbital mechanics can't ensure that the satellite will be above the area of interest exactly when it is needed. Needed. Satellite orbits are designed to keep the most interesting areas of the globe under surveillance at the price of a less thorough coverage of other areas. Satellites can maneuver and vary their orbits, but since they can't be refueled, this is an activity that requires careful consideration. When the tank is empty, they will be stuck in their final orbit for the rest of their useful life. Russia has the advantage of being the country with the largest land surface on the planet. It is very difficult to cover it thoroughly, so hiding something in Siberia is definitely possible. However, covering the conflict zones, their immediate vicinity and the key logistic hubs is well within the capabilities of the US space-based reconnaissance. And then there are the drones. This work got us used to the large use of drones, the medium-altitude long-endurance drones like the Bayraktar that stole the stage at the beginning of the war have now been wiped from the sky by the air defenses of both sides. They are simply too vulnerable. What are still massively used though are the commercial drones. Ukraine has literally bought everything that was available on the commercial market. I was told by a source that a realistic estimate is from 50,000 to 70,000 commercial drones acquired 
only for the summer offensive, because they were acquiring even before, obviously. They need so many, because these systems are quite short-lived. Some are turned into suicidal drones, so by definition they don't survive the mission. But those that are used for observation and reconnaissance have an average life of only six missions, because the Russian electronic warfare is dense and capable, and they have basically no defense against it. The key element, in my opinion, is that they are available to almost any small unit being employed on the ground. The level of situational awareness that they can contribute is basically unprecedented in history. So far we have talked about Ukraine, but what about the Russians? Well, it is basically the same thing word for word, just to a lesser degree. They do have exactly the same category of systems, there are just fewer of them, and some also have inferior capabilities. So there are fewer electronic intelligence aircraft, there are fewer AWACS, there are fewer satellites, and so on. There are two differences, though, that partially compensate this lesser degree. The Russians have a very large ground-based and helicopter-based electronic warfare and electronic intelligence capability. This kind of capabilities are not so common in NATO service and even less in Ukraine. They are either organic to Russian large units or they are organized in entire autonomous electronic warfare brigades. These assets are largely unknown in the West, at least to the general public and, let's say, the less focused analysts, but there are dozens, literally dozens of types, each one with a specific function. And they have proven their effectiveness in Ukraine several times. The most notable element is the GPS jamming and spoofing capability that is compromising the effectiveness of basically anything GPS guided. The other is the capability of downing drones of any type and the commercial drones in particular. Personally find the Russian approach to electronic warfare fascinating and maybe we will cover it in the future even though, well, it's not aircraft. The other important difference is the use of military light surveillance drones. The Russian medium-altitude long-endurance systems, the ones more on the light side, kept flying, albeit with some difficulties. The most interesting example is the Orlan. It's just a small toy plane with a gimbal camera. In reality, it has allowed for very fast kill chains with the Russian artillery. Uh, there are two versions often used together. One version is a reconnaissance vehicle and a communication relay. And then there is a slightly bigger variant with a laser designator for precision fire. It is used to identify Ukrainian moving targets and quickly react, directing guided munitions on them, like the Krasnopol round, which seems to be available in large quantities. These small drones have proven to be difficult to detect and attack because, well, they are small enough and fly high enough not to be easily visible with optical systems, and they have a very small radar cross-section having, well, few metal parts. They have been hit, and they have been downed, of course, but they turned out to be quite survivable. Now, why I am telling you all of this? Because in Ukraine we are seeing something unprecedented. The battlefield is transparent. Both sides have enough intelligence to know everything there is to know about the enemy. Anything moving in a depth of, say, 20 kilometers from the contact line is detected and, if possible, it is attacked. The Russians have less intelligence at hand than the Ukrainians, but they have enough to understand what is going on very clearly. You must also remember that this is a war where a lot of information is publicly available, much more than any other war in the past. I mean, there is enough information out there for an OSINT organization to produce maps with relatively accurate orders of battle. If civilians can do this, I let you imagine what military intelligence could do with access to all the assets we discussed above. The consequence is that tactical surprise is no longer possible. Manuals say that a competent commander should be able to achieve tactical surprise in most situations. This is no longer true. You can't, for example, attack frontally a position to fix the forces and send a unit around to attack from the flanks or from the back. The unit going around will be spotted and the enemy will react. 
So you may say, if surprise is not possible, what about speed? And that is what Ukrainians tried to do in the first few days of operations. We heard times and again how the Ukrainians should operate more according to NATO doctrine, practicing a war of movement. Well, they tried. They sent company-sized columns of combined arms against the Russian positions, and they were spotted and attacked by artillery, anti-tank mobile teams, and helicopters. And this led to the loss of some very high-value Western assets. I personally believe that Ukrainians always knew what was going to happen, but they had to demonstrate to the Western supporters that in the conditions of this war, these tactics don't work. So the obvious question is, what kind of tactics may work? The Russians have preponderant artillery superiority, but the Ukrainians are using artillery and precision systems with a great effectiveness too. Uh, they're probably running out of ammunition, hence the entire DPICM's uh, story, but this is a different subject. We had Russian witnesses explaining how the density of Russian lines has always been very low, much lower than expected in pre-war simulations. Units are split in small teams of no more than 5 to 10 men who occupy a single position, separated by at least 100 meters from each other. Each of these positions is not a target worthy of concentrated artillery fire. A Russian company after the reorganization is less than 100 men, and it may end up covering a kilometer of ground, or even more if deployed in an isolated stronghold. Well, in the First World War, you could almost fit a division in a kilometer of frontage. Another consequence is that the risk of staying out in the open is very high. Every time it is materially possible, a unit must dig in or seek some form of coverage. And in fact, the only areas where some concentrations are possible are those where some coverage already exists, that is, urbanized areas and wooded areas. The latter more in spring and summer than in autumn and winter for, well, obvious reasons. In these areas, collecting intelligence is somewhat more difficult, simplifying the job of the units in there. Many planners watch the Ukrainian theater, mostly flat, with relatively few natural obstacles, and they see a territory ideal for armored forces, very difficult to defend because the defender has nothing to hide behind. This is no longer True. This is World War II stuff. The combination of pervasive intelligence and firepower on both sides make any movement in open terrain extremely dangerous, particularly for concentration of forces. If you had the largesse and flexibility in the use of mines, particularly on the Russian side, well, it appears that maneuver war is no longer possible. Open terrain has become an almost impassable obstacle for both sides. And this is not limited to maneuver, any concentration is just a target. And if you can't concentrate your forces, you can't really attack. Some will point me to examples where attack was possible and mobility paid off. True, it happened, but this was the exception, not the rule. And there were particular conditions that made it possible. For example, a very low force density on the defender side. So, what is the solution then? Well, there is one, and we have seen it work since the so-called Popasna breakthrough and during the so-called Russian Winter Offensive that included the first battle of Bakhmut. Small infantry teams advance in areas where cover is available, tree lines, woods and developed land with a massive fire support to suppress and possibly destroy the defensive strongholds before the attack. If the attack is successful, the attacking force is joined by engineers digging defensive positions and sappers clearing the area from mines and other explosives. Tanks and other infantry vehicles are used only for transport and fire support from a distance. And the result of a successful attack is an advance of a few hundred meters or the conquest of a small group of houses. A slow grinding progress at best. And it is a very costly progress too because losses are high on both sides. This is the textbook definition of a meat grinder. You also understand that since the advance can only be slow and methodical, the possibility of a real breakthrough where the attacking force finds itself with no more defendants in front and could penetrate deep into enemy territory, well, 
is almost non-existent. There's always time for the defender to move some reserves in the area and restart the process. In all of the above, is explaining what we have seen so far in this war, the high losses, the small movements of the front line, uh, the artillery war, and so on. So, how is the Ukrainian summer offensive developing in the light of these considerations? So, well, this is the part where, quite uncomfortably, I make my best impression of an armchair general and try to interpret what is happening. In the first week, the Ukrainians tried to break through the Russian defenses and failed with heavy losses among the units involved. Some say there was just a series of probing attacks, but I don't think so. They were well aware of how the Russians' defensive positions were set up. These attacks were supposed to roll over the advanced Russian defenses in the buffer zone and make contact with the main defensive lines in a matter of days. The decisive element that makes me think so is that they have been using some of the high-value Western assets they were given just for this task. What both cursed and partially saved them was the attempt to go through the minefields. Since the number of the mining systems is limited, they couldn't deploy entire battalions in combat formations, but they had to resort to company-sized columns moving behind the demining systems or the narrow demine corridors. When at first they were pounded by the Russian artillery and by anti-tank missiles, well, they stopped. In this way, only some elements of the advance's forces suffered heavy losses. To those who say that we know of just a couple of cases where this happened, I reply that statistically, for each specific case we know of, for each vehicle we see destroyed, there are many more that we don't see. One thing is keeping track of the social media posts to identify where the units are. An entirely different thing is tracing each and every movement on the battlefield. This is something that the two opposing militaries can do, but we, as civilians, can't. And the ones you don't see, well, depend on the side you are taking your news from. I tend to take the host sent organizations that produce lists of lost assets with a boulder of salt, since I believe that there are a good reasons to doubt of their impartiality, but this is just me, I don't expect you to agree. So, very reasonably, Ukrainians changed tact and resorted to the tactics we have described before, which brought some success. As I record this, the deepest penetration from the beginning of the offensive in the south is around 6 to 8 kilometers, so nothing particularly exciting. Moreover, we have seen that sometimes they still try some small mechanized operations, but, well, nothing major. Paradoxically, in the area around Bakhmut and other areas of the contact line, where the Ukrainians did not try a mechanized operation, but they started with the tried and tested tactics, the progress has been slow but steady. In the last two or three weeks, it seems that Ukrainians are also focusing on reducing the Russian overwhelming artillery superiority with counter-battery operations and precision-guided weapons, like guided artillery rounds or rockets. And it seems that they are obtaining some successes if we have to trust the words of the just-sacked Russian general Ivan Popov. However, considering the disparity of the two artillery forces, is definitely an uphill battle for the Ukrainians. So, is the offensive succeeding? Well, it depends on the expectations of whom you ask. Surely, they are not doing better or worse than my expectation. Even though nobody cares of my expectations and... Rightly so. Some time ago, I published a few shorts where I was discussing in summary the subject I am covering here, and I sort of predicted the situation, so I know it's not polite to say so, but I told you so. However, this offensive was sold to the general public as something out of World War II or Iraq 2003, and that did not materialize and probably is also going worse than actual NATO expectations. They were likely expecting to be at the main line of resistance in three or four days. If I had to guess, the Western intelligence was convinced that the morale of the Russian forces was very low and they were expecting to see units just melting away and refusing to fight. This, of course, did not happen. On the contrary, maybe for the first time since the beginning of the war, we have seen Ukrainian units surrendering or refusing to attack. It is not a large-scale phenomenon by any means, 
but it is happening sometimes. So if we look at the general picture in the south, Ukrainians in a month and a half just managed to barely dent the Russian buffer zone. A zone that the Russians themselves were expecting to lose in a few days of combat, and that is not a success at all. If the objective was to regain control of the land bridge and reach the coast of the Sea of Azov, well, it is clearly failing. If the objective, though, was to inflict losses to the Russian forces, then we may argue that they had some success so far. And this is taking us to three very strange considerations that we have to do about the events that are unfolding in front of our eyes. The first is that Ukrainians seem to be adopting an attrition strategy, but being on the offensive, they are taking more losses than the Russians. Since they have less resources than the Russians, this doesn't seem to be a strategy that could pay off in the medium long term. I really don't know what to think. It could be desperation, but I don't think so. Or it could be that there is a reserve unaccounted for ready to enter the operations that nobody knows about. In a way or another, I have the sensation that I am missing something on this subject. The second is that the Russians are fighting for the buffer zone way more than it should be expected. They are defending the area, they do counterattacks, and the frontline units have been completely involved in this fight. If I have to believe the maps that show the military units, the Russian reserve is still intact and in position, so only the frontline units have been involved so far. But I can't explain this either. Uh, maybe the Ukrainian attack was so weak that this option was indeed practical, but I don't believe so. Maybe they're not confident that the main line of defense is capable of being a serious obstacle, but I don't think so as well. So I suppose we will have to wait and see. The third oddity is, well, three months ago, the Ukrainians were running out of air defenses. So where is the Russian Air Force? The Russians are indeed flying more than at the beginning of 2023. Helicopters and air-to-ground aircraft are an important component of the Russian reaction to the Ukrainian offensive. However, a large portion of the Russian Air Force is still not involved in the operations, while other units are overworked. Why are we not seeing an increase of the operation of the Russian Air Force as the Ukrainian missile supply is running out? I have an idea about this because I've heard unconfirmed news, so take this with a boulder of salt, that Ukraine received through shady international channels a substantial supply of S-300 missiles. But this is, as I said, totally unconfirmed, uh, particularly considering that Ukrainians, and to a lesser extent the Russians, have vacuumed all the available international resources of the type of weapons that were just available. Obviously, they didn't do this themselves. There have been several intermediaries. So I will be keeping a close eye on the air operations despite the scarcity of news in the last few weeks. So this is a picture of what is happening. Basically, a high technology stalemate between the two sides. Is there any way, are there any circumstances that could change this situation? Well, I personally believe so. There are two types of events that could change the situation on the battlefield, military or political. From the military perspective, the question is, how could the Ukrainians achieve their objectives? And I think there are two possibilities, but let's proceed with order. I have seen different numbers in different analyses, but so far no more than a few brigades of the force set apart for the offensive has been used. The losses have been quite heavy in the order of 20-30% of the force, which means that those brigades that were earmarked as the can opener for the offensive are basically no longer operational as large units. You always need to remember that the strength of a large unit, uh, like a brigade or a division, is more of the sum of its parts. And it derives from the combination of the different elements. Since these elements are never worn down uniformly, even a 10% of losses might alter the composition in such a way that makes the unit way less effective. And according to NATO doctrine, a unit that has suffered 10% losses should be retired and refitted. However, the bulk of the Ukrainian offensive forces are still intact and, at least according to the Ukrainians, the big push is yet to come. 
Is there any way to use them to break through the Russian lines and do something? Well, maybe yes. The sector around the town of Novomikhailivka is quite strange. This is where the front line turns north from the general east-west orientation in the south. There is just one line of defense quite close to the line of contact and there are no Russian reserve units behind the line. North of the area, there's the Donetsk metropolitan area, where the most of the forces are actually part of the ex-Donetsk militia, which is definitely not the best part of the Russian forces. It seems that the Russian lines here are thinner than in the north or in the south, and it seems that there is no backstop in case of penetration. Maybe, just maybe, always consider that I'm just an armchair general. Maybe an infantry push executed ignoring the losses could open a breach wide enough for the mechanized units to penetrate. There's going to be no surprise, as we said before, but Ukrainian reserves should be able to reach the area quite quickly while the Russian reserves will have a longer route and might get there late. There are no major roads leading to this point, but a few kilometers in the Russian-occupied territory, there is a motorway going south to Mariupol. The railway going through the land bridge is also not far off. So even a moderate penetration could really create logistical problems to the forces in the land bridge They will be reduced with the, basically with a coast road. Moreover, moving south, the Ukrainian forces would have the pre-war fortifications on their left flank, which would help in the advance. Or another possibility is, rather than pointing straight south, there could be an uppercut around Vuledar, menacing the side and the rear of the Russian defensive line. This sector so far hasn't been really active. Here there is that famous stronghold, the Menagerie, but that's basically it. The Ukrainians, though, have a number of heavy units right behind it or in the nearby Velika Novoselka. Does this mean anything? We'll see. With this option, it's also possible that since the Ukrainians have received some little-known amphibious capabilities, that a diversionary attack may happen across the Dnieper River, exactly at the opposite end of the front line. And this may cause a really bad headache to the Russian reserves. So it seems a possibility to me. Well, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Anyhow, in the same way I noticed it, the Russians probably noticed it as well. So there's probably something else going on that I don't know. And we'll see. But this is not everything. I personally see another possibility that is even more interesting. So behind the Northern Front, which by the way, in the last couple of days is actually moving a little bit, there is a large Russian heavy force that has been there for months uh, since the end of the Ukrainian offensive, doing basically nothing. Or better, they have been re-equipped and they have been training. Uh, what are they going to do? Well, nobody knows. Uh, they look like a theater reserve to me, and sooner or later it will be used. We also know that they are being used as a training ground for mobilized units, but the same units are also receiving all the most modern equipment. So this is a potential threat and makes the Northern Front a bad candidate for an offensive. But what if Ukrainian tried a quick attack beyond the Russian border toward Belgorod. The Russian border is not as heavily defended as the front line in Ukraine, and Belgorod is just 20 kilometers inside Russia, and it is an extremely important logistic hub for the entire northern front. The Russians must protect it, and it would be assured that these reserves will be moved to counter the attack. And once the reserves have moved, the Northern Front becomes vulnerable and the second attack in the area of Svatove could penetrate very deep, potentially, maybe moving the front line back of another 50 to 100 kilometers and undoing the conquest of a large part of the Lugansk Oblast. Okay, 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 I'm well aware of the political consequences that such an operation may have, but I can't stop thinking that threatening one of the major enemy's logistic hubs is the move that makes more sense. Uh, the Ukrainians have shown a constant willingness to bend the rules and limitations imposed by US and NATO, and I suppose that when you are s desperate for survival, nothing else matters. 
Anyway, the same applies. I believe that the Russians have thought about this possibility too. And yeah, let's wait and see. So these are the two military options that I see the Ukrainians may have to conclude this offensive with a success. However, I don't think that any of them has a high probability of being successful. They may be, but it's difficult. And the reason I think so is quite simple. These units that Ukraine has prepared for the offensive are probably the last units available. The Ukrainian population is now depleted. The losses are high. 12 million of Ukrainians are abroad and there are press gangs in the street forcing people in the army. Then there are not much more assets that the West could give. Maybe if we wait a couple of years, the Western industrial production will catch up. But governments change. The popular sentiment in the West is not as compact as the governments are in supporting Ukraine, and the new governments may reflect this attitude. If Ukrainians burn all of these forces in an offensive, then there will be little else remaining. The Russian reserves will keep growing, and then it will be the Russian turn. I think that Ukrainians would be better off trying the offensive, but saving a good proportion of their most modern systems and best trained forces to form a strategic reserve in being, like a fleet in being, just to hold the position till something else happens. And this brings us to the possible political events that could cause a successful Ukrainian offensive. Sure, the most effective but least likely would be a Russian change of regime. This seemed to have happened a few weeks ago, but it turned out to be an enormous farce that actually left Putin stronger than before. I know that many will not share this opinion, but this video is already very long, so I won't go in any more detail. The other possibility is the intervention of some of the Eastern European countries in the war under national authority. While two or three Polish divisions could do wonders for the offensive, I am not sure that the Russians will appreciate the difference between NATO and national authority. I suspect that in this case we will have the answer of some of the questions that we have, or at least I have. I think that we will learn very quickly where the Russian Air Force is, and we will learn how many cruise and ballistic missiles are remaining in the Russian availability. And spoiler alert, I believe that the Russians stopped firing crews and ballistic missiles just short of the number necessary for a massive attack on European airfields. I may be wrong, but I hope I will never be proven right. But finally, the most impactful political event could be a ceasefire followed by negotiations. And this is the options that I personally favor. Again, I'm sure many won't agree with me, but I believe that saving lives is a priority. Ukrainians have already done a lot. They already inflicted several defeats to the Russians. They should be realistic and accept open negotiations while they can. If nothing else, to rebuild their forces and be ready in the future for a second round. I would prefer not. I think everyone would prefer not, but I would understand Ukrainians. I really, really would like to wake up one morning and discover that the guns are now silent and I can go back doing videos about flight dynamics that nobody watches. Thank you very much for watching this video so far. Please, if you can, do the usual youtube stuff, that is subscribe, like, hit the bell to get all the notifications. The algorithm lately hasn't been really kind to me, so any help is really appreciated. And if you like the show, if you want to contribute to keep it going, while there is Patreon, you can become a member, you can do a one-off donations, you can buy a model for your models, there is an affiliate link below, I have a small percentage, there is no extra cost for you. Final thought for all those who are supporting the channel already, I would like to hug you all, you are in my heart, you have no idea how important you are. So, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time. And stop.